to be or not to be. Or you can... Vloggerdome! The TV Show! Episode 4, The Right to Die, featuring Glynos, and with contributions from Vox Neruda and Derived Energy, and with special guest, Dr. Frank Cavanaugh of the Final Exit Network. Welcome to Episode 4 of Vloggerdome, on the subject of the right to die. Shouldn't really be a subject, I mean the right to self-determination should be kind of a modern right, one that's completely embraced by most people. Uh, the idea that we have a self, a body, uh, an identity, and uh, really the only consequence is when you're going to do something to impact others, and if you're going to do something impacting yourself, there's generally speaking a social understanding that, uh, yeah, it's your business. Um, but these subjects that touch on morality issues and religion um, are difficult to... Uh, get with the program to move them into some sort of rational perspective. So it's taken you know, hundreds of years for people to get rational on the subject like sexual preference and um, the subject of dying uh, with dignity and by choice um, does seem likewise to have to go through a process of disengaging people who claim ownership ownership of the property of your philosophy and body. They um, presume to tell you what's in your best interest and uh, what the right way to be is or the right thing to do is. So um, as a political issue uh, it should be understood that yeah this is your own property, your body, that you should have this right to self-determination, that you should be able to use the, the advantages of uh, medical technology for your purposes, not necessarily their purposes, um, and uh, it really shouldn't be that much of a conversation uh, beyond some effort to um, persuade people who uh, might be making a reckless or sloppy decision. Um, there are ways to make this fail safe, and I'll go into those, but it seems there are it's more of an, uh, an ideological argument than a pragmatic or practical argument. Um, like abortion and many other subjects, um, I think it is mostly veiled in traditional religious notions of offense to the Creator. That you're not allowed to offend a God, our nature, by um, deciding um, for yourself uh, what the right destiny for your life is. Um, and what, val what you value. Um, clearly it is a killing yourself, committing suicide, um, is a statement. It does say something um, about the design. Uh, it's not perfect quite obviously. It seems a minimal statement is in there saying this is not a perfect design because I'm going to have to exercise some volition um, to do this right, to die right. Nature will not kill you uh, efficiently. And um, for those who believe in God, um, apparently God doesn't have much of an appreciation for efficiency either. Um, and it's really just about whether or not we as individuals uh, have a right to offend somebody else's God um, fundamentally, or some kind of pantheist, deist, uh, uh, Gaia, nature God, um, where somehow the nature knows best um, when you should die and how you should die. Uh, and I don't believe that's true. So the simple political solution to any arguments that are made about protecting the those who aren't exercising full competence 
Um, ironically, we don't need any such protections for people who sign up for the military. A bunch of young people sign up for the military to get a job killing people for money. And nobody feels any obligation to test their veracity or the uh, integrity of their will to kill <laughs> somebody else. But if they chose to kill themselves, yeah, we would have to psychiatrically test them because that's insane. It's not insane to kill somebody else for money. But, um, yes, it's questionable whether you should die when you're suffering. Um, or think that it's, uh, maybe it's time to get out when um, your circumstance becomes um, less than uh, pleasant in its prospects, let's say. Uh, so, if we have a living will, we can establish people's intent. So, you know, at 16 years old, let's say people would sign a living will. Um, basically pointing out that they have philosophically no problem with um, death by volition under the right circumstances. And then they would also assign a guardian uh, for their life um, who would basically testify that the person isn't uh, insane at the time they might request uh, help. Uh, noise coming. Um, and, uh, you know, this way we can protect people from um, suspect judgment. Um, you know, if, if we're worried about somebody um, saying they're going to kill themselves because they're a burden um, on other people or for some other reason, that guardian can be their defense against uh, some kind of extortion like that, and that they can testify for the person, essentially, that the person doesn't really want to die, but uh, they also don't want to be a burden and that it is that intractable circumstance that's driving them to it rather than uh, any real desire uh, to no longer live. So it can be made fail safe is the point. Um, you can just create a couple of mechanisms, social mechanisms, where people, like I say, if, they, if, if you chose, if, you, if you're a religious person and you know you never will ever want to take control of your death, then you can basically sign away your right and never have it again unless you're willing to go to court and explain to a judge why you've changed your mind. And uh, so there can be protections against um, misfunctions in judgment. Um, I can't think of any time in my life where I would have signed away my right for me to decide rather than you to decide for me. So there was no point in my life where I would have thought it a good idea to trust you with my life, <laughs> ever. So, um, yeah, I would certainly sign up for keeping my rights and not giving them to you. If you wish to give your rights away, you may do so, but you don't have a right to take other people's. Um, the right to self-determination um, is just so fundamentally obvious as a fundamental right. Uh, you know, unless you have a reason to trespass on my judgment, you don't have a right to do it. And uh, the fact that I um, am, have rationally drawn a conclusion about um, dismal circumstances and doing something efficient about them doesn't give you any right to jump fences and say you're going to take control of somebody else's life. It's obnoxiously arrogant and... Uh, fundamentally unconstitutional behavior by uh, an unrestrained and uncontrolled majority. Uh, so anyway, that's enough for now, I think. So, enjoy the show. Yeah, it's kind of a rough subject, but uh, it's fundamentally one of the greatest health care issues there is. Uh, you can't do better than preventing unnecessary harm and suffering in the world. And uh, the, we, we waste preposterous amounts of money forcing people who have no desire to live to somehow acquire the desire. And yet we'll watch all around the world people who have intense, passionate desire to live. And, uh, and, uh, you know, lots of want. And uh, they lack 50 cents to do it with. And that hypocrisy in itself, that... that non sequitur, that insane circumstance kind of illustrates that there's no sincerity to your desire to oblige people to live. 
and that it's really just about an offense to your God, whether your God to be a God or your God to be nature. And that's all you're really um, interfering for, is to defend the insecurity you have um, regarding your philosophical perspective. So anyway, then if for commentary. Till next time. Approximately one million people kill themselves every year. Hanging, shooting, drowning, stabbing, many must resort to extreme and often painful acts to end their suffering. In this country, we cherish liberty. The right to die, to determine our own fates, is the ultimate freedom. What the suicidal want most is to feel in control of their own destinies. Life is an arduous journey for even the most optimistic of us. People's lives are destroyed every day in this world. There are no guarantees. Accidents, mental illness, physical illness, poverty. We are all at some degree of risk. Some people see this journey as being worth all of the risks and the hardships. They see a light at the end of the tunnel. For others, however, this light is merely an oncoming train. Neither of these perspectives can be proven correct, so it should be up to each individual to decide how much they are willing to endure. What pain is worth what gain? The answer to that question will be different for each of us. If someone who wants to die even dares bring up these issues, they are ridiculed, humiliated, deemed crazy, sent to the psych ward, stuffed with pills, and ultimately, and probably worst of all, they are ignored. Death is an unstoppable force, and it comes for every sentient creature. We can't actually choose to die. We can only choose when and how. None of us chose to be born or to die. Life and death are both imposed upon us, and no one signs a contract that says, yes, I am willing to be exposed to all the dangers associated with this existence. To force miserable people to live lives they didn't consent to is akin to slavery. We all have attachments to others, but that does not mean we have a right to dictate how they live their lives or even if they should live at all. Some feel unceasingly tormented by this existence. Every waking moment is a moment that never should have been. It's wrong to demand a loved one who is in pain to live for the sake of your attachments to them. That is not loving them. That is taking from them. Giving people the right to die on their own terms could actually help those same people live longer. If people felt they had a safety net, a tool in defense of the uncertainties of being, many would be more willing to face challenges. Everyone wants to feel they are masters of their own fate, and giving them this fundamental right will give the suicidal the strength and sense of control they so desperately long for. It will give them a sense of peace in a world full of chaos. Still, some may choose death, and that's okay. The harsh reality is that there are millions of people dying to survive every day. We need to stop wasting resources obligating those who don't want to be here and instead focus on using these resources to help those who desperately want to live. Don't weep for those loved ones who choose to die. They did what all of us desire, to live on our own terms. Instead, think of them as saved from their suffering. On the subject of the right to die, an individual has a fundamental right to invest their own welfare in their own judgment, and maintaining the ability to say, I want to live, is not placing too high a standard on survival. Life is imposed without consent, and once an individual reaches the age of consent, they should be free to contract a different choice. Along with rewards, living carries great risks and no individual should be coerced or forced to accept those risks. Suffering is the most valuable commodity in the universe, and it should never be endured or imposed unnecessarily. Opposition to a liberal right to die is primarily driven by poorly motivated religious zealots who wish to force law to reflect the dogma of their gods. 
a right to die that fairly protects all legitimate life-supporting motivations of society can be constructed. It is proposed that upon reaching their 17th birthday, all individuals be allowed to name a person to be their legal guardian and establish a living will, stating whether or not they wish to maintain a legal right to die. At any time in the future, the person would be free to revoke any interest in having the right to die, but to regain the right, an individual would be required to go to court and defend the competency of their change of mind. To exercise their right to die, an individual would present to an appropriate medical authority the living will affirming their right, and a notarized statement from their guardian verifying they believe the decision to die is competent and appropriate. Such a system would substantially protect any vulnerable individuals from any momentary bad judgment or pressures, and society would be able to fairly protect, rather than destroy, a vital liberty interest. Hello YouTube. So I finally arrived at my brother's place. I'm really dreading this. He has this tendency not to understand anything I say, and then to misrepresent it. This could get ugly. The fucking hell are you talking to over there? Time to go inside. How come you don't want to have kids then? Well, I spent a few years reading and listening to different arguments, and the only two arguments for having children seem to be I can or I want. Where do you find these arguments then? Well, there are a few books on the subject, but mostly online. <laughs> so you were saying you believe everything on the internet then? <laughs> You're a fucking idiot, but People on the internet believe loads of bullshit. Oh, no. Show me one of these arguments online then. I'm not sure that's the best idea. Oh, come man. I just don't think it's going to be your cup of tea. Nah, no, that's because you know, but... What do I know? You know I'll be able to fucking prove them all wrong, but... <laughs> okay, let me see what I can find. Okay, this is a guy called Derived Energy. Approximately 3.7 billion years ago, dormant energy slash matter began to configure itself in such a way as to begin a process that would result in sentient organisms Fucking walking, hell. falling, slivering, and flying Fuck on it. or near the surface of this planet. This process hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. I don't understand a fucking word he's saying. Well, well, his accent seems pretty clear to me. He's using all those fucking big words, man. Show me someone else. Okay, this is Beardy There's Man. There's a lot of these people... Beardy Man? The fucking... ...cannot bring themselves to say anything against... or go with antinatalism, or say anything against mom. They just can't do it. There's, there's a psychological block. I can, I, you, can all, I, you can hear it in, in Anton. He's moving up towards, agreeing with Gary, but kind of bumps into Mal. Ah, right. And then... So what he's saying there, then, is people hate their mothers. Uh, no. I don't fucking understand any of it, but... Adventures of an Antinatalist will be right back. <laughs> this month, Floridome proudly welcomes Dr. Frank Cavanaugh of the Final Exit Network to have a chat with Amendum about the right to die. Dr. Frank Cavanaugh serves on the advisory board of the Final Exit Network. He has been a health educator for 40 years, retiring as professor of medical and public affairs at the George Washington University Medical Center and professor of communications with an endowed chair at George Washington University. He is chairman emeritus of the International Academy for Preventative Medicine and a former vice president of the Cooper Institute for Advanced Studies in Medicine and the Humanities. His years in the medical community helped him to understand the tremendous advances we have made in intervening in patients' health issues and improving lives, but also too often how the medical community walks away from patients at the most critical time in their lives when nothing more can be done to relieve their suffering. Dr. Frank Cavanaugh and Inmendum are both passionate advocates for the right to die. Let's hear what they have to say. Alright, so on the subject of the right to die, uh, we have a special guest, Dr. Frank Cavanaugh, who's uh, connected with the um, 
final exit network and advocates for the liberty of people to gracefully exit and uh, has probably spent some years doing that. You want to say a little bit about yourself, Frank, and your history? Sure. Uh, our organization uh, is an organization of about 3,000 all volunteers around the United States. We don't have any, any paid staff, any offices. They all tend to be sort of senior citizens and elderly people like myself who are involved in it. And uh, in a prior life, uh, I was a faculty member of the George Washington University Medical Center in Washington, D.C. I wasn't a medical doctor. I was a Ph.D. and my areas were health policy, health law, health care communications, health management systems, those sorts of things. But with my 23 years in the medical center, I saw the wonderful things that we did in intervening in people's lives and making them better. And unfortunately, I also saw how we, when we could not make them any better, we too often walked away from them at the most critical time in their life. And uh, I retired and came to Florida, and I thought, well, there are, what kind of things do I want to do? What am I really interested in? And that stayed with me for quite a while. And uh, uh, I was familiar with the Hemlock Society, which started way back in 1980 a man by the name of Derek Humphrey, who is still alive today in Oregon. And uh, Derek wrote a book called uh, Final Exit. And it is published in 12 different languages. It was on the New York Times bestseller list for 19 years. And uh, he, uh, uh, he gave rise to this movement, if you will. And uh, it actually, the Final Exit Network itself got created in 2007. And I decided then that... Uh, uh, it would be a good thing to volunteer my time with. So I have. Uh, many people come to the organization because of the terrible situation in the, in the prolonged death and suffering of a family member uh, and volunteer that way. But I just came because I, I saw that the medical profession I didn't think was responding in the proper way. Uh, lots of emphasis on keeping people alive, procedures, not enough on what we would call end-of-life care or really aid in dying uh, as such. So that's what, that's what brought me to it. Yeah, I, I um, you know, over the years I've always been interested, even as a, a youth, I kind of had a perspective that this should be a natural right, you know, that this is, you know, life is complicated. It's not a free lunch, okay? Uh, you know, you can get harmed living. And I always kind of thought this is not something you impose on people. It's up to them to decide. And, and I, part of it, I guess, too, as a youth, I, I remember reading a, a book on the mind, and it had images of mental hospitals in the past. And, and you, you saw the horror that these people lived in. And you're, you're just saying, well, this is just so unnecessary and crazy. I mean, you have these incurable circumstances. And what do you do? You have them in cages? You know, you, you, you're, you know, just, you know, I, I would just imagine I wouldn't pay that price. You know, there's nothing I'm going to do in my life that would ever justify me volunteering, you know, sure. to be the victim. So I always had this perception that this was a valuable thing. I remember Derek Humphreys and, you know, the, I guess he started first with his wife. You know, he actually had to assist her and that was his first Jane's Way, I think was the title of that book. Correct, yes. um, and and, and uh, you know and then Kevorkian, and I, I'd like to bring him up just as a, a reference, just to sure. see if you have an opinion. But I, I love Jack Kevorkian. I mean, I think it was, uh, yeah, yeah. He tried. He pushed a little too hard. Um, you know, you'll find fault with anybody's strategy. But as a man, as a character, as a human being, just you couldn't get any more generous. And he spent seven years in prison. You know, be, because he advocated for people taking their own volition, acting on their own judgment, and merely needing a little assistance with one of the most difficult processes in life, dying. Yeah. My take on him is that I have a very high regard for him. He was a character. He was outrageous. You know, all of the years where he provided the means for people to die, and they actually uh, initiated the Mercitron machine, uh, Jeffrey Feiger, his de attorney, defended him in court in Michigan, and he was acquitted each time over and over and over. Then he decided that he wanted to get the issue to the United States Supreme Court. And he said, a way to do that is I will inject somebody myself. I will take their life. I will videotape it. I will go give it to 60 Minutes, 
And, of course, that's when he became charged with murder. And then he made the second mistake of defending himself in court. You know, uh, everybody has a fool for a lawyer when they do that. And, uh, of course, he lost that case and then went to prison. And after he came out of prison, he lived for about a year and then passed away. But he did a great deal in promoting the dialogue about the right to die. He did a great deal in advancing hospice in this country with better palliative care. Uh, really focused on on uh, the end of life and uh, and people who are in that situation. So I think most of the people that are involved in the movement, while they recognize he was a little crazy, uh, thank him for the contribution that he made and the way that he sort of advanced the movement, if you will. Yeah. Yeah, it's it is kind of a tricky. Um, you know, there's a lot of subjects like abortion. There's different subjects that have existed in the dialogue for decades. You know, you know I mean, I, I you're a little older than me, so you have a longer experience. But it's just, it seems to get talked about. You know, somebody brings them up. A governor, I remember Governor Lamb at one time had brought up the right to die. You know, sure. and it gets a little bit of momentum. The people start talking about it, and then it just goes away. And it's like Kevorkian spending the seven years in prison. And there was no dialogue on the subject. No, the doors just closed and the silence, you know, remained. And, um, you know, you have these other cases in other countries and you have other policies in other countries. And it just seems like the core issue has never really gotten to. And that's why policy never seems to evolve. I mean, there's a there's a fundamental political question about what are our rights as individuals, you, you know. And then there's this philosophical question where even if you're saying you have a right to trespass against our rights, to say I don't have a right, you know, I, it's too dangerous to give me freedom, you know, regarding my own life, that's too yeah. dangerous. Even if you're going to make that argument, you still have to make a philosophical argument to make that rational, you know, that you're not just basically imposing some sort of theology on me and saying I have to live up to your definition of what my life is and my life is something either nature is supposed to control or God is supposed to control. Why am, why am I not supposed to control it? You have to explain why you're right and I'm wrong and these people don't seem, the, the subject, no one's ever forced to, the law is never forced to say why it is right. Well there isn't there a momentum certainly in, in the world and the country, as you say, in terms of rights. We went through women's rights, we went through voters' rights, we went through gay rights, we went through disability rights, and I would suggest that the, that the right to die with dignity is the ultimate human right of the 21st century. And we're surely coming, it was, you know, they tried way back in California uh, to pass legislation, uh, had a very difficult time there. They went to Oregon because it was a smaller state. And Oregon was the first state by a voter initiative to pass the right to die with dignity and physician-assisted dying. And that's been in place now for 17 years. Uh, and with a very good track record, when it happened, it said, people said, oh, my folks are going to be killing themselves like flies, you know, dropping over. That never happened. Uh, there are maybe 100 people each year who get the medication from their physician when they're in a terminal situation. And only about half of those take the medication. What that says to me is that once you have the means in your hands to easily end your own life, that you have control of your life and that that's very important to you. And you can then go on for another day, another week, another month, you know, some such thing as that. And then in 2008, the state of Washington duplicated that law. Uh, in Vermont, 2012, I think, or 13. Uh, there was legislative action and the governor of Vermont signed off on it. So you had those three states. And then you had the interesting situation where in two states, Montana and New Mexico, the Supreme Court said that a physician could not be prosecuted for hastening the end of a person's life. So now we have five states uh, in the country where, where dying with dignity is possible uh, in that sense. and. Uh, I'm not sure it's all going to come very fast. I think probably in you know, the next 10 years of my life or something, we might see another five or six states. But there is a steamroller going on and strong public opinion in its favor. Uh, one of the good polls by Harris and BBC America found that when people were asked the question of, um, do you feel that a mentally competent person with a terminal or an irreversible illness has the right to end their own life, 70% said yes, uh, only 17% said no, and the remainder said, well, I'm not sure. 
The 17% who said no uh, were principally of the Catholic faith. And the strongest opposition to this movement is not necessarily Catholic individuals, but the Catholic Church, who says you do not have the right to take a life. Only God has that right. And we get people who come to us for information and support, and very often they're Catholics. And we will ask them about their faith, and what they say is, um, I think my God would be comfortable with my decision uh, to end my life. Uh, therefore, it's okay with me, if you will. Uh, yeah. I, should say, uh, I should say just a bit about our organization, because we do have some limitations, and we do operate within the law, if you will, and, and we try to, although we find ourselves invariably in court in some part of the United States. But what we hold is that mentally competent adults who suffer from a physical or an irreversible illness uh, or intractable pain have a basic human right to choose to end their lives when they judge the quality of their life is unacceptable. And that right, by its nature, implies that the ending of one's life is one's choice, including the timing, the person's present, and it should be free of any restriction by family, friends, government, medical profession, clergy, uh, no matter how well-intentioned those people may be. Um, I should say also there are some things that we don't do. We don't ever encourage anyone to end their life. We don't ever provide the means to them to do so, and we don't physically assist them in any way. They have to perform all of the tasks. So what we're doing, and where we won in the Supreme Court in two different states now, is our First Amendment right of free speech, because all we do is we provide information and support. If you were in that situation and you had uh, an irreversible or a terminal illness and you came to us, we would ask you to put your situation in writing. We would ask you for a copy of your medical record. We would have three physicians evaluate that medical record and see if it appeared that you warranted our support. If they didn't disagree, a fourth physician would be brought in. But if they agree, then someone comes to visit with you at no expense anywhere in the United States uh, to talk with you and really to determine that you are mentally competent and that you're not temporarily depressed where you might be helped by medication or therapy uh, or some such thing as that. And if you're determined to be competent, then we say to you, all right, we will provide you with the information to help you end your life. If you want us to be there with you when you do it, we will also be there because we don't think that anybody should die alone. Now, in many situations, this is kind of a living wake with family, as it was with Brittany Maynard, everybody around, kind of a celebration of the end of suffering. But very often there are family members who don't agree with this, so the person is left alone, uh, somebody who would try and stop them if they knew. And that's where we say, if you want us to be there with you, we will be there with you. So that's kind of the work of a final exit network. We're not unique. At all, uh, there are some 57 different organizations in 26 countries around the world that have some form of aid in dying that are working on it, whether it be advanced directives, whether it be uh, voluntary euthanasia, all of those things. Uh, um, so this is, it is a worldwide movement and it's coming. There's certainly gonna be no federal action that would allow it to happen. It's gonna have to happen on a state-by-state -state basis. We will return to our conversation with Inventum and Dr. Frank Cavanaugh very soon. And now, back to Adventures of an Antinatalist. So these are the people that convinced you not to have kids? I suppose so, yeah. Oh, and Gary. Who oh, fucking else, Gary? You know, Inventum. Ooh. Let me show you. Ah, this is a good one. Human beings are need machines. You don't create the need, then you don't have a fucking problem. You don't have a need that needs satisfying. It's not that fucking complicated, asshole. We come into the world, we make the mess, and then we clean up the mess, and then we give ourselves a blue ribbon. That's bullshit. Alright, that's like a fireman who starts fires to justify his existence. Do deal something with that analogy. Okay, deal with the fact that would it make any sense to have people who start fires just so they can get paid to put the fires out. So hang on a second. He's saying then that no one should have kids. Exactly. You don't believe that, do you? I do, yeah. So that means you don't think I should have kids either then? 
Look, this isn't about you personally. It's just an ethical question. Nah, no, fuck you, but You said I shouldn't have fucking kids, right? That means you want to fucking kill my kid, is it? No, that's not what I'm saying at all. Don't fucking lie, but I know what you said. I'm gonna uh, fucking have stop. you. Stop! This is the voice, this is the voice, this is the voice of Radio Free Naruda. Proceeding was brought to you by the makers at Golematic. Bright lies for dark truth. And now back to our conversation. Yeah.
yeah. Well, I, I don't, uh, I'm not uh, excluding the, the uh, ability to have the proper lawsuit, you know, constructed the proper way to finally edify the fact that we do have these individual rights. So I'm not, um, I don't, I don't, I think it is ultimately a constitutional right. I think it's fundamentally a violation of my constitutional rights for anyone to say they're going to tell me what life means. That's a philosophical concept, and nobody has a right to tell me what my pain's worth or what the joy of a sunset is worth. It's, those, aren't, those aren't their property. That's my property. And it's a, it's a clear violation, a clear trespass of a Jeffersonian notion of rights for them to say they have to jump the fence and have to save me from my own judgment. Prove I'm incompetent are pretty much shut up, right? That's how I look at it. If you can't yep. prove I'm incompetent, we don't have all these tests, right? All these tests you have for these people's judgment, I, I'm not saying it's not what you have to do as a pragmatic matter, but we don't do that for the military, right? We let an 18-year-old boy decide, I want to be a murderer and get paid to do it, right? We don't ask him any questions at all. We don't find, we don't get a bunch of doctors to figure out whether he's sane or competent or not a crazy maniac, a sadistic lunatic. No, we don't care. More sadistic, the better. And, and, and so the, the, our hypocrisy in policy should be, in my opinion, okay, is just so glaring. You know, the hypocrisy of our caring about even people's lives, right? We watch people die all around the world for a lack of 50 cents a day. 50 cents will buy a human life. A human life desperate to live. And yet we will pretend we care when we force somebody to die horribly. I mean, right. to me, it's sadistic, it's cruel, it's ignorant, it's bigoted, and that's, now I'm not saying it should be your argument, but I'm just saying that's my argument, okay? Yeah, they, these, they, these people don't have any justification because their hypocrisy is glaring. They're defending their own insecurity about their own philosophical position, you know, their religion, and that's all they're doing. They're defending God. And they're using my rights. They're throwing my rights on the altar to sacrifice to their God. It's a right they don't want. It's a right they have no use for. Well, then sign a piece of paper saying you don't want the right to die. I, don't, I shouldn't have to sign a paper saying I want authority. If you want to give away your rights, if you're afraid that someday you're going to do something crazy, well, sign away your own rights. But don't sign away mine. Don't yeah, steal mine. If, if, and then those pieces of paper are, are so important because most of us hope that we die at home in our own bed peacefully, and 80% of us die in hospitals with all kinds of things plugged into orifices, surrounded by people arguing about whether or not we should continue to live, uh, and just a commercial for the advanced directive, you know, to say to people, have the conversation with your family about what you do and do not want. Would you want to live on a feeding tube? Would you want to live on a respirator? Make sure that they understand that. Sometimes that difficult, that conversation is very difficult to have. And people say, oh, I don't want to talk about death, you know. But if, if I love you and want to honor your wishes, then I want to know what they are. And once we've determined that, then put that in writing, have it signed, uh, have somebody appointed as a health care surrogate to speak for you if you become in a permanent vegetative state. You know, those things are sort of all key to the process. Very often when we're young, we think we're immortal. And we think of woman, uh, people like uh, uh, Karen Ann Quinlan, Nancy Cruzan, Terry Schiavo, all women in their 20s who thought they were immortal until they went into a permanent vegetative state. And once they hit that and didn't have that advanced directive, then they went on to live for 10 or 15 years while husbands and mothers and fathers argue about whether or not they were going to pull the plug because it was never discussed, was never put to down, and never written. So so it is worth for most folks taking the time to do those advanced directives, and you're never too young to do them. Yeah, well, that's exactly, uh, you know, I'm advocating a similar policy where people would be obligated to have a living will, and then they would have a guardian, as I call it, or whatever, for life, and they would, you know, if somebody died or something happened, they'd have to get a new one. But that, that person would just sign off you know, as a final judger of the circumstance. So for disabled people who worry that they're going to be coerced into killing themselves because of, you know, 
bringing a burden or something else. Obviously, this advocate would always be there to say, no, they don't really want to kill themselves. They just feel like, you know, they're being pressured because they're expensive or a burden. And so, you know, this would protect, you know, we can make it fail safe, essentially. We can protect the emotionally and psychologically vulnerable without taking away everyone's rights. We don't have to sacrifice, you know, human dignity and human liberty, um, you know, to prevent Harm, real harm from happening. But again, I would argue you, your examples of Karen Ann Quinlan and Cruzan are again examples of hypocrisy because you think of the millions of dollars, okay, not a small amount of money, but actual millions of dollars spent sure. to prolong these vegetative states and for what? As a monument to God. There's no other, you're not doing anything else. You're just, and you, to think how much comfort could be given in the world with that money just points out again these people their hypocrisy you don't care about the living if you will throw away resources on human vegetables and that's what they were um, you know f as a token to show how much you love life yep. you don't love life if that's what you do with the resources that can provide comfort and we went to such extremes. And Terry Shivo, 15 years, you know, George W. Bush came back from vacation to sign an order to keep her alive uh, and let it continue to go. And for 15 years before her husband, he still lives in Florida here, finally won that case and was allowed to take her off life support. But, but 15 years of that is horrific. Uh, certainly some way that she never wanted to or ever intended to live. Yeah, and another issue you've brought up is the, med I call it the medical industrial complex. You know, everything sort of turns into a complex. But the, you know, if medical doctors um, didn't have a self-interest, I mean, they do have a self-interest. They're, they're making money off the last years of life or the most expensive years, right? The last seven months of your life, you're going to spend half of your, med all the medical expense right. of your life half of it's going to be in the last seven months of your life so yeah they want to drag that out because that's half their income right okay. i mean i don't want to be too cynical but clearly if the medical profession would come out rationally and say look yeah this this is part of life i mean the dying is part of life and obviously you know why shouldn't we do it anything other than gracefully why yeah. why why should you do it? Well, there shouldn't be a single misstep it should be the most beautifully orchestrated of one of the most, it should be as good as a wedding. Okay, your dying should be as great as your wedding. It should be, a, it should be an event in your life to celebrate your existence, celebrate what you have accomplished, maybe lament some of the things you messed up or you blew, but what, you know what I'm saying? You sing the song, I did it my way, and you gracefully exit stage left. I don't think any rational person hooked up to a polygraph test could say they're against that without there being some reason, like you brought up the Catholics. I mean, they're the ones that put Kevorkian in jail. Let's understand there's a Catholic judge and a Catholic jury, and they put him in jail for seven years. So these, these religious people aren't harmless, and I think it is a big part of the subject, because I think it's part of the politics. So I'll just I'll bring up one more political issue. I don't want to swamp you, but, no. you, you know, the real problem with the issue is, is that, uh, you know, these Republicans, there a lot of conservatives are for the right to die, but, you know, they're part of a party that has to placate the religious right. So they can't do what the party actually wants to do. There's lots of, you know, uh, financial conservatives who would be all for the right to die, but they're not going to vote for a liberal, you know, and so they're stuck bound to this religious uh, fundamentalism that keeps standing in the way. And it happens, in, you know, we, I could see it in the politics in this state because they came very close, you know, to passing a right to die law. Probably. And, you may well be the next one. And again, yeah, it's just this, this, it's just this, this little bit of, of, of nasty Republican politics that stood in the way. There's an interesting thing of, in, in this movement, too. People tend to think of it as a liberal movement, an individual human right, that, that liberal people would support those rights and so forth. But I find on the conservative side that you can make the case for, hey, get the government out of my life. Why should the government be telling me whether I could live or die? And that becomes a great conservative cause. So there are a number of, apart from the political realities of how you do something, 
there are both conservatives and liberals who support this idea for different reasons. Right. Now, I'm saying I, I'd always want people to support it because it's a, it's a basic human dignity and because of compassion and because you don't want to waste suffering. But obviously, too, if you're a financial conservative, I can't even tell you how much budgetary money you're going to save, okay, when you're not when you're not shoving tubes in people who don't want your tubes, okay? I mean, when you're spending a fortune to tie somebody down and do procedures on them and do tests. Uh, my grandmother lived to be 107 years old, and the last day of her life, they did a diagnostic MRI. Wow. Now, can you make any, you know, a diagnostic, they were diagnosing somebody who's 107 years old. Why are they doing that? And they tied her down, they tied her down to do it. You hear that all the time of somebody at a great age who all of a sudden they said, we're going to give this person a pacemaker and, you know, keep the heart going. Well, there's nothing left of the body for the heart to keep going. So you mentioned an interesting thing before, and I think it's very important, and I was pleased that you said it. You kept saying the word liberty, and we often talk about this as a human right, and you can make a distinction that a right is an activity that requires others to assist or cooperate in some way in allowing you to help have that. However, um, liberty is something that we may exercise without imposing obligations on somebody else. And that hastening the end of a person's life may be thought of as a personal liberty for those who are irreversibly ill or are suffering more than they can bear. So I sometimes think that when we talk about it as a human right, we ought to talk about it as a human liberty. And I'm glad that you did that because there is a medical model, you know, that exists in those five states where a physician must provide you aid in dying. We have physicians review you, but we give you the complete control over your life. In other words, when the time comes that you wish to end it, you can easily acquire in your own community the means and do the simple physical tasks that are required for a quick, painless, and a foolproof death. Uh, that does not require a doctor to agree, because even in Oregon, Washington, Vermont, those places, a doctor may say, no, not, I don't believe that, I'm not giving you the medication. So it's still their individual choice, and you're still dependent upon the doctor. And what we have is essentially a non-medical model uh, that does not make you dependent upon the doctor. time we have for this conversation this month, but if you would like to hear the rest of this interview, please visit us at our official website, floridome.com, and or our official YouTube channel, where you can find the rest of this conversation, as well as other conversations, other episodes, vlogs, extras, live events, and more. We also have a Facebook and a Twitter account, and we welcome you to follow us on those as well. Do you have a counter-argument to anything from this episode or regarding one of our other topics from other episodes? Well then please get in touch with us and make your argument. We can be contacted at any of the social media networks mentioned previously, but we can also be emailed at vloggerdome at amendumarchive.com, and we are also proud to announce that you can now leave us a text argument on the new Video Soap Forum. If we like your response, it may just end up being part of the show. We actually have our first ever text argument this month by Rignolo. Rignolo's argument is an argument for the right to die, and it reads, An argument regarding natural death. Some people seem to think that an intelligently self-directed death is intrinsically worse than an undirected, natural death. This leads to obliging people to suffer to the end of their lives by natural afflictions, which is an unjustified imposition to those with disregarded preferences. The tendencies towards specific kinds of results in evolution are by natural processes and do not have intrinsic purposes. There was no cause in evolution to safeguard against considerable end-of-life suffering. People need not have uncommonly high intelligence to be better qualified than an unthinking natural default in making decisions about the end of their own lives. That was great, Rignolo! Thank you very much for your contribution, and hope to hear from more of you guys soon. See you then! It's like a gas pump with 4,000 holes in the hose. That's what life is. Oh yeah, fill her up! <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. The only accurate analogies or metaphors would have to include something preposterously wasteful, grotesquely rude and obnoxious to anything rational, sensible, to any kind of notion of love and beauty. Those concepts are completely disgraced by this debauchery that we call fucking life.
the stupid, grotesque nonsense that goes on, the deformities and the, the brutality, grotesque, obscene brutality. The whole fucking audience ought to get the fuck out of their chairs and walk the fuck out. I mean, it just doesn't deserve anybody's participation in any kind of, oh, it's just a journey, you're gonna die anyway. <laughs> oh yeah, that makes it so much better. I'm gonna die anyway. Oh yes, what a great reason to live. So I can die anyway another day. Yeah, so I can spill some more guts before I cash in my guts for good. It's just littered with all this slop and imperfection and everybody just keeps talking like we just keep marching through the slop as if we're actually going somewhere. It's going to be Shakespeare plays forever. All it is is pointless drama. It's pointless want, chase, wheel, deal, stab in the back. It's all crass crap. I mean, it's just so stupid on every fucking level. And the fact that people finally understand that, they actually become aware, oh, I get it, stupid. Oh. And you fucking goddamn almost mock them. This whole fucking thing is so obnoxious that I have to actually explain to these assholes why there'd be some reason I wouldn't be too enthusiastic to play this preposterously idiotic fucking game. It just feels undone to leave it this way. It feels undone to sit there and just say, okay, I'm gonna get the fuck out. But you know the game is going on. You know that you know everything that made you sick, everything that everything that's got you just totally I gotta get out of here is still there. And so you it's like it's like jumping off the Titanic when you know the the nursery school hasn't been evacuated. The, the job isn't done somehow. There's something you gotta do before you jump off the boat. I mean, really, it's just obnoxiously insulting that I have to sit there and I will even explain to you people why this play sucks. Fuck the optimists. It's not even optimism, it's delusionary rainbow sickness. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's, yeah, whatever. Yeah, I've, I've said all I need to say. So yeah, I wish I could offer some comfort, but I can't. Uh, I wish I could offer some advice, but I can't. So yeah, instead I just ranted. <laughs> yeah, that's what I did. So, until next time. You people are insane. Fuck you guys. I'm going home. Blah 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 blah. Preposterous. Just preposterous. So in conclusion. None of us asked to be here in the first place, and really, all because of a few cowards, zealots, and tyrants, human beings are being denied what should be one of the most fundamental rights of being alive. To take control of one's own death, to invest in one's own welfare, and to be assured of a graceful exit, an ending befitting the dignity that every living, feeling thing deserves. If this is a cause you believe in, please do whatever you can to insist that all human beings have a right to a clean break from their suffering at the time that they choose. Fight for it to be fail safe, fight for it to be made available. Work hard to get people thinking about why this is so important. But chances are, you won't. And your inaction is just another reason why we are doomed. But try not to doom anyone else as much as possible. Try not to impose as much as possible. Just being alive makes you a taker. Your every happiness paid for in the suffering of some other sentient creature. You are, in fact, by your very design, an asshole. It's extremely important for all of us to understand the myriad ways in which we are, in fact, dangerous to other feeling things in this world. Try not to impose as much of that dangerousness as possible. No matter how small you are or how powerless, you will in fact have an impact. Use whatever power you have to minimize the suffering. Please?
Thank you very much for watching another episode of Vloggerdome. Next month's topic is democracy. See you then!